Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10? It says, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Father, we, we thank you, Lord. We, I ask, God, that you would help us to, to come together as a body and that we would invite your presence to move us, that we would be enthused, filled with your anointing. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would touch each life and make them a light in darkness as we grow the perfect church. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Well, last week, if you weren't here, well, I know that we recorded it. It'll probably come on YouTube eventually. We talked about perfect people. Amen. Well, today I want to talk about the perfect church. Because I was here, you know, people, say, you know, they want to belong. How many want to belong to the perfect church? Right? Everybody said perfect church. You know the, the old joke. Well, if you find the perfect church, you'll ruin it. Because once you get there, it won't be perfect no more. Right? But I have, a, I have a twist on that. See, the perfect church begins with perfect people. Right? Colossians 3.12 reads, Since God chose you to be holy people whom he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender heart and mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now notice what it says, that scripture, and we talked this about last week, I'm, I'm going to get you here. He said, you must clothe yourself. Now, when you're a child... A baby, mommy always clothed you, right? You know, I see now we see the baby, and, and they, don't, they don't dress themselves. They, they, the mom gets to put all the clothes on them. Come on, mijo, come on, little, my, my little baby girl. Let's, let's get clothes, and they dress. But, but as you get older, if you're 20 years old, and I see your mama clothing you, boy, I'm going to slap you. There's something wrong with you now. I mean, well, you let your mama don't clothe. What's wrong with you, dude? Right? So Because you, you grew. Well, see, Colossians, the same thing. He says, since God chose you to be holy people whom he loves, it says you must clothe yourself. A lot of people say, God, well, God hasn't dealt with me in, in this area. or God hasn't dealt with me. No, no, no. When you grow up, you have to put it on yourself. Clothe yourself. Put your own clothes. So he said, clothe yourself with tender heart, mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That's what we talked about. That's how we ended up, we we'll opened up this whole series, right? But what we found last week was there were seven types of people that make up uh, the church, the perfect church. And I'll talk about the perfect church today, but the seven perfect people, <coughs> excuse me, have issues. Amen? Look at your neighbor. Said, we have issues. Huh? See, seven types of people that make up the perfect church. First, we talked about the Sherman tank, the tank, who is rude and condescending. Then we talked about the wet blanket, always complaining, complain, 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 crying. The user manipulates their way around. The volcano, they blow up without a moment's notice, right? You have the thumb sucker, hello, always looking for pity. Poor me, so sucking their thumb. The garbage collector fills up with lies and gossip. They love to hear gossip. They just fill themselves up. Then you had the seven, of, was the space cadet. You never know who's home, right? The space cadet. And see, these are different traits, and, I, and I, we share that those seven types of people make up, they're perfect people. They make up the perfect church. So you have these type of people, don't look around, don't talk about you, I'm not talking about your neighbor. We, we all have that in us one time or another, amen? So we are the perfect people, right? See, God chooses the perfect people that I just mentioned to attend the perfect church. Colossians 3.13 again, you must always allow, make allowance for each other's faults. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive the person who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. So I've heard people say, I don't want to go to church because people are, are this and people are that. They are, and this is the great line, they're hypocrites. Listen, hip, people, hypocrites are everywhere. They're not just in church. They're at your house, at your, 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 your relative's house. They're at, the, they're at the supermarket. They're in the bank. Uh, they're, they're everywhere. So don't, don't use that line that I don't want to go to church because they're hypocrites because they're supposed to be hypocrites here because they're everywhere. 
Well, oh. Right? So, three things perfect people would have uh, and they should do is they have mercy, kindness, humility. Oh, not three things, but several things that they have. They operate in these things. They, they, they operate, right? They make allowances for each other's faults. Perfect people always operate out of forgiveness. And perfect people are not easily offended. So if we have these issues, there are seven issues we just talked about, because we all recognize that we have those issues too, right? You can't just point around. Because we have an issue, we all make allowances for other people's faults. Huh? We always forgive and we don't take offense because those seven people will offend you. Maybe, and oftentimes, not intentionally, they're just the way they are, that's their personality, right? So, why does God bring so many perfect people together? First, to bring us to maturity because people will help you grow. You need those people because they will take and they will bring out the best and the worst in you because it's got to come out. Second thing, so we can evaluate ourselves because you will have, the most trouble you'll have with a person is the person who is most like you. So this will help you self-evaluate. Four, we need to reap what we sow. There are great lessons to be learned by reaping what you sow. So you have to, that's part of the process. And lastly, we found last week, it makes us more dependent on God. When you're dealing with people like that, all you can do is, is say, God, help me. Help me forgive this person, even though I think they're an idiot. Hello. Help me be patient with this, this person. I need help. See, that will bring you to more dependence upon God. But if you react out of your own nature, if you're the volcano and you react volcano to volcano, what happens? It creates problems. And you're not putting on tenderness, mercy, you have to put it on. That's called growing in the Lord. Amen? So now we're going to pick up and really look at the perfect church. But before I do, I have 12 reasons why a pastor will never go or will give up going to a sporting event. You know, a football game. How many like football? It's, it's for opening opening um, day today. For, I, I almost wore my Raider um, tie, but I held back, you know, and so it, we have Monday night, the Raiders versus some other team, and I, that's, that starts, amen, but I love, I love going to sporting game, uh, events, basketball, the dubs, you know, we'll still be in it, right? but there's 12 reasons why a pastor might give up going to sporting events. First, every time a pastor goes to the game, well, I'll make it personal, because I'm a pastor. Every time I go to a game, they ask me for money. Second reason, the people with whom I sit with at the game don't seem very friendly. Third reason, the seats are too hard and not comfortable. Fourth reason, the coach never came to call on me. Gruden should at least call on me and recognize that I was there, right? But he didn't. The fifth reason, the ref made a decision I could not agree with. Sixth I was sitting with some hypocrites who came to see what the other team was wearing. Seven, some games went into overtime and I was late getting home. Eight, the band played songs I didn't know. Nine, the games are scheduled when I want to do other things. Ten, my parents took me to too many games when I was growing up. Are you getting the picture? Eleven, since I read... A book on sports. Since I read this book on football, I feel I know more than the coach. And 12, I don't want to take my children because I want them to choose for themselves what sport they like best. Now, I'm being facetious, but you get the picture? So let's look clearly at, at the early church and see what, if we can apply what it takes to be the perfect church. Amen? Three major signs of a perfect church. First, the church prays together. They pray together. And see, there has to be a point where if you're visiting or you've been here a while, that you begin to say, you know what? I need to get involved in prayer 
as a body. Amen? And Acts 4.24 reads like this. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. So the most powerful thing to happen is when the people come together and pray. See, this is the most powerful thing, and I think that no one can argue that, but it's also the least used tool amongst the modern church. The modern church, for whatever reason, busyness, activity, whatever, they find it very difficult to come together as a people and pray. If I want to have a small gathering, all I got to do is say is on Fridays, we're going to gather every Friday for prayer. And people will get busy. Because prayer isn't important. So the main impression given off by many in the church, they tell me prayer works, but I'm not so sure. And when we come with this ideal as when nothing else works, pray. And that's okay, but we should pray, believing beforehand that that's what we need, prayer. So I believe prayer works. Some people say that. If I ask anybody, do you believe prayer works? They go, of course. But then they also say, but I don't have enough time to pray like I should. See, oxymoron, if you believe something works, that means that you would take time to do it. Amen? In Acts 4.29 again, it says, Now the Lord considered their threats and enabled your servant to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Now, what did that start with? That started with these people were under pressure and they began to pray first. Pray, but they came together. Now, it was a new movement. They were all excited. They, 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 they had a, a, a core of believers, but those believers began to pray. And you'd be amazed what will happen when we actually put an emphasis on prayer. We need to pray. So a good prayer, James says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Notice, James tells us in the book of James chapter 5, you need to confess to each other, pray for each other, not so that that person will be healed. So if Larry has, has an issue or whatever, if I pray for him, the Bible says, as I pray for him, I'm going to be healed. Now, I don't know what issue you have, but we know we have issues. So that would trigger my thought pattern. So what should I do? If I want these issues and me to get better, I should get on my giddy up and start praying for people. Because why? When you begin to pray for people, James promises that you will get better. Huh? So, but we got it mixed up. We always say, Pastor, pray for me. No, you should pray for me. That way you get better. Let me say that again. You should pray for me so that you would be healed. It's a principle that, that the Bible puts down. See, generally, prayer has great power and wonderful results. Huh? So even if we don't pray, everybody can agree that there's something unique about prayer, something special about prayer. And notice James' example of a, of a powerful prayer. In James chapter 5, verse 17, go ahead and turn there. In James 5, 17, it says, Elijah was human as we are. That's very important because sometimes we say, well, Elijah can pray, but he's different. No, no. James killed that right away. He said, Elijah was human as we are. And yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for the next three and a half years. Then in verse 18, he prayed again prayed for rain. And down it poured. The grass turned green and the crops began to grow again. So we are people that expect God to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders. Okay, fine, but we are the activators. We are the one that begin to, to move God's hand. I don't know why he did it, but he says he's waiting for us to pray so that he would move. Now, he doesn't need us, but he's allowing us to participate, to, to get involved in what, what God wants to do. But how often do we come to the prayer meetings? See, the perfect church is a praying church. Huh? Proverbs 15, 29 says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but He hears the prayer of the righteous. 
The second thing, the perfect church is filled with the Spirit. Baptized with the Holy Ghost. Acts, again, we're still in Acts chapter 4, verse 31. It says, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the Word of God boldly. Now, I, I've run across Christians who are not filled with the Holy Spirit. They, they, feel, they have a lot of knowledge. They know the Bible inside and out. They can preach in the Greek, in the Hebrew, in the jalapeno. They got it all down. But are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Oh, well, I don't really uh, operate the gifts. I don't really believe in that stuff. What are you talking about you don't believe in that stuff? Huh? The Holy Spirit is what it's all about. Jesus says that I am leaving. I'm going, but going, but don't worry. I'm, I will send another like me. Huh? He, he didn't say uh, that I'm going to leave you uh, fatherless. No, he, I'm not going to leave you on your own. I'm going to send another like me. See, the church, the perfect church are filled with the Spirit. And my friend, if you're not filled with the Spirit, then you must be filled with something else. Because people filled with the Spirit, they look alike. When I say look alike, not maybe, you know, face, you know, complexion, nose, ears, but they do look alike. You can tell those people that are filled with the Spirit. Why? Because they're always emptying themselves. Uh, they, they know that in them is no good, so they empty themselves of their way of thinking, of their way of operating. Why? Because many are full of themselves. And if you're full of yourself, you leave no room for the Spirit. The Spirit of God is looking for an empty vessel to fill, not one who has different motives, different ideals, different kinds of... No, no. The, the Holy Spirit is looking for one who is empty. Uh, even Jesus says the, the, the word, oh, the, the word of, but it's not important. But Jesus came to earth, and the Bible says that he emptied himself of who he was. Here, here is God, the creator of the heavens and earth, who is at the right hand of the Father in heaven. He says, I'm going to empty myself of who I am, go down to earth, and not just be uh, go to earth, but I'm going to be born a child. Could you imagine Jesus, God, the creator, was a child. He emptied himself, became a child, learned to be an adolescent, learned to be a young man, learned to grow up. And he emptied himself because he was empty. He was full of power. So we have to get to that point where we empty ourselves. Be filled with the Spirit. Huh? The second thing, uh, well, let me go. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. It reads like this. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Hmm? So the, the key is give thanks in all circumstances. That's a, may, a heavy statement. So, so you mean God? When somebody talks about me, I got to be thankful? Yes. You mean, you mean if I lose my job, I got to be thankful? Yes. See, there's it's all circumstances. He didn't, qual he didn't uh, quantify it or qualify it or, or separate it. He said, in all circumstances. Why? Because when you go through these things and you don't allow it to affect your flesh, you, you have proven or shown that you've emptied yourself because those things are no longer bothering you. That person, my friend, is ripe and ready for an anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know about you, but that's what I want. But what, what do we do? When those bad things happen or good things happen, we react to them and we allow these things to dictate who we are. And we have to allow God to dictate who we are. The Holy Spirit. Huh? See, the thing, another observation I, 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 I see about people filled with the Spirit, not only do they look alike, huh? but this person is not easily hurt. They're not. They can go through stuff, you can talk about them, and they, they just they, they shake it off somehow. They're in the Spirit, they don't allow things to hurt them, and they keep moving on. They don't let things get them off their track. They know what God has called them to do, and they stay, they stay focused. They, 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 if you talk about them, they pray for you. Why? Because you, you're in trouble. Because my battle's not with you. Huh? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow God, and God's going to fight my battles. I don't got to fight with you. I don't got to argue with you. I ain't got to defend myself. I don't got to do all that stuff. But those people that are easily hurt, they're so full of the flesh and themselves, you can't even get around them. Huh? See, people that are filled with spirit, not only are they they're not easily hurt, but they can handle emotional attack. Huh? 
Why? Because they give thanks to God in all things. Hmm? See, there's some things we must take into account. Do not be over insensitive, accept rebukes with a positive attitude, and never take criticism personally. Never. See, being filled with the Spirit brings an anointing. And I don't know about you, but I need an anointing. In this day and age, I need an anointing. With this generation, I need an anointing. Without an anointing, these people, this people, this generation, us, we, all of us, can try our patience. Well, it's a tough gig trying to stay saved and be right when you have to deal with the world. Amen? Or oh, that's just me. Come on now. But we have to be filled with the Spirit. It says there in Acts 4.33, back to that chapter, it says, With great power the apostles continually to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and much grace was upon them all. With great power. It began with prayer. They were filled with the Spirit. They didn't let things bother them. And the Bible said they had great power. Began with prayer, filled with the Spirit, great power. See, we all want the power of God. No, you don't. You got to begin with you. You got to kill you before you get the power of God. Could you imagine if God gave you his power and you're walking in the flesh? You'll wipe everybody out. No, no. You have to die before you get the power. You have to pray. Then God fills you. And then it says, there's power. See, so there's a power, powerful dynamic you will have when you're filled and walking with the Spirit. The Spirit gives you grace. The Spirit forgives. The Spirit is merciful. So right there, if you're not any of these things, then what are we? What are we? Huh? So there's, there's five simple reasons that God gives you his anointing. And he wants to give you his anointing. Luke chapter 4. Let's all turn there. And Jesus quantifies what we're called to be. Quantifies what he wants us to be. Because we're, 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 we're called Christians, right? And that means we're Christ-like. So when I, when I heard that term, I go, okay, if we're Christ-like, then what was Jesus' plan? What was he to be like? So if I'm going to be like Jesus, it's very simple. And he says it right here. And he boiled it down to five things. Luke 4, 18. Jesus is speaking. He goes in the temple. All the religious folk are there. And the Bible says he opens up the scroll, begins to read from the scroll. And it says this, Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he, he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then the Bible says Jesus rolled up a scroll, put it down. That is his mission. If that is Jesus' mission, then that's our mission. If that is not our mission, then, then there's no need to pray. There's no need to be filled. There's no need to have power if that's not our mission. It's not that complicated to me. So let's examine God's five modes of operation a little more closely. Gospel to the poor. Now notice his mode of operation. He always brings gospel to the poor. When I say poor, I'm not talking that financially poor. That's not what he meant. Poor. They're, they're poor in spirit. They're lacking something. They're, they're, there's something about them that they're not, they're not, they're not happy with. There, there's something going on in their life. When he called King David, he was but a boy, a shepherd boy, unwanted, uh, looked down as a little ruddy kid. In fact, when the prophet came to anoint a new king, the father didn't even want Jesse. He said, oh, you know, well, let me bring my boy. But, you know, David, he's a little kid. Keep him on the field. We, we, we want to hide him. He, perhaps a little ashamed that he was a little ruddy kid. Uh, he didn't have nothing going for him. So hide him. But let me put my big boys, you know, the big ones, and here in front of the prophet. So the prophet picked the right one. No, 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 no. God always looks for the poor in the spirit. When he chose Moses, uh, he was out there running. Moses was not a, much of a man. Oh, yeah, he was raised, but he was out in the field for uh, the desert for 40 years. Couldn't even talk, the Bible says. He said, I can't talk anymore. And he complied and he argued with God. And God said, since you can't talk, I'll send Aaron. He'll be your mouthpiece. Uh, when he chose the disciples, he didn't go to the University of Jerusalem. 
where the apostle Paul was in training. He didn't look for students that sat at the feet of Gamaliel, Pharisees. No, 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 no. He went to fishermen, to people out in the dock, dirty, hardworking bunch of uneducated men. And he says, follow me. He always goes to the poor. Uh, when he tells us, Victor Rogers, Colorado Springs, to go into the highways and the byways to seek the lame and the lost, he always says, go to the poor. So I would rather say, look, at the, 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 go to all these places, run into houses with the people that live in nice, got nice pads, nice cribs, driving nice cars. Hey, you know what? You want to come up here and do what Jesus calls to do? We can ask them, but very few will come. Why? Because they're too busy paying for their houses, paying for their cars, doing their, 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 their duty. They're too busy. We can't get them here. But when I say, oh, okay, we ain't going to go there, I'll go to the lane. I'll go to the churches of darkness, those lost and bound to drugs and alcohol who want a way out, who are on their way to jail. I'll go get them. And then I'll say, do you want God to use you? You want God to raise you up? See, that's God's MO. He always goes to the poor because the wealthy just don't need them right now. I got, the, I, got, I got some business to take care of. Okay. But God's MO is to go for the poor. Not because that's what he wants, because those are the ones who will respond. He'll take anybody who will respond. All you got to do is say, here I am, I. Send me. The second thing, release the captives. We're called to release the captives. When he reached down to the Hebrew people, they were slaves. When he, when he instructed Nehemiah to leave Babylon and go to Jerusalem, rebuild the city, they were a defeated people. Uh, when he delivered you from addiction, alcohol, vices, uh, you needed. See, our job is to release the captives. Hmm? Release the captive, set them free, enslaved by drugs, vices, jobs, and careers. See, that's what Jesus would do. People say, what would Jesus do? I'm telling you what Jesus would do. Not only that, he gives sight to the blind. When God allow us to see that we're sinners. You know, I, I never understood Christians when I first came to the Lord. Well, before, when I was saved, I, see, I had a bad impression of Christians. I thought they were sissies, weaklings. I did. I said, if you went to church, you're weak. That meant that you couldn't make it in the world. That meant you needed a crutch. You were a sissy. I didn't understand until God opened my eyes. When he, when, he, when he opened my eyes and made me realize that I was the one who needed the crutch. That's why I had to drink every day. I needed the crutch. That's why I had to get high because I, I couldn't handle the pains and, and the struggles of life. So I had to get high. All of a sudden, he, he let me realize that those people that are serving God, that are staying away, refraining from the vices that I'm so deeply in, they're the strong ones. You're the weak one. I get Lord no more. Huh. If he can do it, I can do it. Boy, I came to the Lord. I said, well, how the heck do they do it? Right? Come on, now that's me. How, how do they do it? These are some strong people. How do you do it? You know what they did? They tell me, oh, you got to pray. I mean, you got to just pray. You got to pray. Why? Because, you know, when you feel like wanting to get mad and you want to get high, and all, you got to go pray. I said, well, okay, I want to go pray. Now, what, how, how else do you do it? They start telling me the same thing I'm telling you. You need to get filled with the Holy Spirit. I can't get filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, I need some Holy Spirit, man, because I don't know if I can handle this. Life is hard. I, my eyes were opened, and I realized that I was the one who needed a crutch. Huh? To allow some powder, some leaf, alcohol, some herb to control my life. I was weak. Uh, to God, we're called to, to, to give sight to the blind. When God allowed us to, to visualize our need of a Savior, and I, when I came to understand that, you know what? I can't do it. I cannot walk with Jesus. I can't do this Christianity unless God, you're with me, man, because this is tough. Amen? And if you've been serving God more than a week, how many can say amen? Walking with Jesus is tough. And if anybody tells you it's easy, they're lying to you. It takes hard work. You got to pray. You got to fast. You have to study your word. Why? Because the devil is a punk and he don't like you. And he's going to come after you. Uh, fourth thing, we're called to set those who are oppressed free. Set them free. Remember when Jesus delivered the, the man of a legion of demons? 
set them free. When our Lord sets you free from your mind games, your head trips, we're called to set you free. Huh. And I look now after 35 years, I, I go back and, and I, all the head trips that I went through, why did I go through it? I, I, I tell God, God, why am I going through this? Just, be, just keep doing it. Why am I going through this? Just, just keep doing it. Why? 35 years, I can tell you this. You can do it. It's possible. It's doable. I did it. I came from a, a no good neighborhood, full of drug addicts. My uncle's OD'd and died of heroin. My brother died, OD'd of, of methadone, got into his bones and ate him up alive. And I escaped it. Why? I escaped it because the power of God came into my neighborhood and set me free. I can tell you that it works, my friend. It works. I'm a testimony after 35 years later. It works. And if anybody tells you different, they're a liar. Uh, it works. But we're called to set those free. That's why I had to go through what I have to go through. That's why you have to go through it. My friend, you don't understand this, but your life, your life is important. Your life is vital to the salvation of somebody else. You, your brothers, your sisters, your cousin, your uncle, somebody's looking at you saying, man, you're their hope. Don't you know you're their hope? And there's nothing worse than to feel hopeless. I didn't know people were looking at me. I was trying to serve God. But later, years later, people from my neighborhood come to the Lord, became preachers, got to say why. Because I said, Pat, Al, because I was like the first one to make it out and become a minister of Dikoto, Dikoto Califas. Right? And people were looking at me. I was their hope. I didn't even know it. I didn't realize that. I just was trying to stay saved. They want to suck nobody no more. Amen? God raised you up. God wants to raise you up. See, that's the perfect church, full of those perfect people that are doing this. Huh? Why? And the last thing that we're called to do is proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. What am I saying? See, now is your time to be saved. Now is your time to fulfill your promise. Now is your time. It's a favorable year of the Lord. That's what we're called to do. It's not that complicated. If we're called Christians, those five things we should be doing daily. Something, moving, action. Uh, see, the perfect church, as I come in for landing, are, are three basic things. They're united with each other. They're together. So I appeal to you, brother, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. In the name of our Lord Jesus, that, you all, of, that all of you agree with one another, so that there may be no divisions among you, and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. United. United we stand. Divided we fall. We're called to be united with each other. Not complain about each other. Listen. There's enough to complain about. Nobody's perfect here. Oh no, I say that. We are perfect. We're the perfect messed up people. So stop complaining. That's just life, man. That's people. That's being real. So if we look past each other's faults, look past each other's Shortcomings, we can, be, we can become united with each other in the cause. The fire that I, just, I talked about, our call to reach treasure of darkness, our call to plant churches, our cause to establish rehab homes. We have to be united. Hmm? So what do we need for true fellowship? We must agree. Huh? Amos 3.3 3 reads, the two walk together unless they have agreed to do so. See, Choosing to walk with each other doesn't mean we have to be robots and completely agree. No, but we choose to walk with each other. That's it. Huh? Doesn't mean we're robots. But we understand we're different. You think different, I think different. But we have one cause, the cause of Christ. You have a different point of view, I have a different point of view. You could be wrong, I'll give you the right to be wrong. But we have one cause, the Christ. That's it. Uh, we don't get all deep and, oh, well, since we don't agree with me, I'm not, I'm not going to be with you no more. Because, you know, no, that's impossible to have complete agreement. That's what that means. It means we agree to disagree. We agree. To, our disagreement is not as great as the cause. And that's the bottom line. Our disagreement is not a great, uh, as great as doing what God calls us to do. Uh, a person, you ever been in a boat? I'm not a big boat, a small boat. I was in a rowboat one time, a small boat. But 
five of us. And we're worried about, there's only three of us rowing, right? And there's two, two, the other two that were rowing, they were causing all the problems. We're rowing, and they're all moving around. I go, stop moving, man. This is a big, little ball. You're going to tip us over. But they go, wow, wow, wow. We're just not doing nothing. I, and I, I figured something out. I go, you know what? Give me, give me your oar. Here, you row. And the two people that were moving around causing all the problems, the boat was going like crazy. When I gave them the, the oar and they started rowing, guess what? The boat wouldn't rock no more. See, those people who rock the boat need to get an oar and start rowing. The ones who are rocking the boat are the ones who don't have an oar. They're not, they're not doing nothing. They're so busy rocking the boat, they ain't got time. to. But when you're rowing the boat, you ain't got time to rock the boat. Huh? And that was, that was a principle I learned. I got a pretty heavy principle. Give those people who rock the boat, give them an oar. And you can't rock the boat no more. No. You got to get busy. Amen? Second thing, the fruit of prayer. Well, let, me, let me back up right here. The second thing, the fruit of prayer, Holy Spirit and unity is a sign of the perfect church. Now, all these mis- imperfect people, but they pray. They're filled with the Spirit, and they agree with each other. They're not fighting with each other. Uh, they're not worried. Uh, they're, they're, well, I said again, they're worried what God thinks. Uh, the perfect church is a winning church. The perfect church is a working church. The perfect church is a witnessing church, and that's what we have to be. Witnessing, working, then we win. As I bring my piano player up. Witnessing and working. If you're not working, see, I got, I'm, I'm, what I'm going to say, I'm trying to give you an oar. That way you, you don't rock the boat. You help the boat move. Because when you're working, when you're working, when you're working, you can't rock the boat. But we have so many people that, that come to church and they're not holding an oar. I, and they're the fault fighters. They're looking around. They see yeah, everybody's messed up. They see all the problems. And listen, I can, I'm the pastor. I know all the problems. I know. You don't have to tell me no problems. I know all of them. Pastor, I see the problem. Don't worry. I, I know. I know. I, I should have like a bunch of oars in the closet when you come to my office. Pastor, I see the problem. I, here's your oar. And when they go, Pastor, I see the problem. I'm going to have it. Here's, here's, your, here's your oar. Because when you're rowing, you can't rock the boat. We need, you, we need your help here. We know there's problems. We're full of the perfect church, of perfect people. We all have problems. We know there's issues. But are you doing what God called you to do? Are you doing your part? It's all, all you can do. Amen? We have to work. We have to witness. And then we'll win. Uh, see, the Romans the Bible calls us more than conquerors. And we have to be more, greater than, more than conquerors. See, if you're always defeated, perhaps praying to the Father is not a priority. If you're always defeated, maybe you're not filled with the Spirit. You haven't emptied yourself. If you're always defeated, maybe you're not united with Jesus in mind and thought. If you're always defeated. But I'm going to guarantee you, I'm going to give you a guarantee right here. If we do all the things that we discussed this afternoon, then we're going to have three distinct qualities. You will be a winner. You're going to live a victorious life, and you will be more than a conqueror. It is that simple. It is that easy. You can choose. You can be defeated or be a winner. I want to be a winner. And I see what Christ tells me to do, so I try to do that every single day. Oh, yeah, we have other business activities we got to do. But if you're not focusing on that, then you're going to always have a defeated mentality. Uh, We're winners. The perfect church is a winning church. I want every head bowed and every eye closed.